Hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to Ask Away Health Live. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we are going to be talking about a few interesting things, um, all pregnancy related in this stream. But first, you're welcome. I'm Dr. Sylvia, your host, a general practitioner and health educator with Ask Away Health. And um, coming to you today, um, just on the background of the news of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, just this morning. So you may be hearing that news wherever you are and just wanting to send um, thoughts and prayers to his family. Um, of course, the Duke of Edinburgh, a very popular royal in the United Kingdom space and around the world. So um, yes, we're just coming to terms with this news and um, uh, lots of um, people sending their greetings, sending well wishes as, uh, to the family as well. And um, it's sort of the first thing that we heard as we sort of turned on, <laughs> turned on television just a, and looked on social media just a few, about an hour, a couple of hours ago as the, as the news broke. So understandable as um, people are picking up this news, but there, there we are. Um, if this is the first time that we're meeting, um, welcome. Thank you for clicking on this video. And of course, if you've clicked, you're interested in things pregnancy related. But we also discuss other things on the channel, trending medical information, health and lifestyle topics. And I'll go into some detail about those later on in the stream. Um, we're discussing pregnancy stories, um, a, a series we've been running for a few weeks now. This is actually the 10th episode. So really feeling quite pleased about the work that we've done trying to put this material out there into this space, particularly to help out women who are pregnant um, or women who just had a baby and families as well, because information, accurate health information is essential to help us make the right um, decisions. So we started by asking ourselves whether uh, or to take a closer look at the possibility that women's health um, uh, during pregnancy may be generally glossed over because, well, you know, pregnancy is a natural event, so women should go through it without issues. But that's not true, as um, any woman who, or most women who've had a baby will tell you or their families. And from a thread that went viral on Twitter, I decided to start the series, and I think it's been quite positive in terms of the interaction and the information I've been able to go through. So we've been able to get through to um, <laughs> week 10. And I'm just going to show you some of the other areas that we've, or some of the areas that we've covered before we get into what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to have a quick look at sharing my screen with you, if that's possible. And um, let us see. So when we, when we started, the intention was to look at common medical conditions that women, women could experience around childbirth. So we've looked at breast issues and problems, things to do with um, episiotomies or perineal tears around labor or childbirth, serious and severe vaginal bleeding problems, <clears throat> excuse me, that could happen in pregnancy, abnormal vaginal discharges um, in pregnancy or after pregnancy, their causes and what to do about them, trouble with the bladder, leaking urine, um, so urinary incontinence during pregnancy and beyond, a common problem, it's embarrassing, so people don't like to talk about it too much, especially, um, but it can especially affect women in terms of their sexual health, it can be quite embarrassing and difficult to discuss, but it is an issue. And so we talked about this on a live stream, hoping to be able to encourage ladies to uh, talk about it, um, bring it up if it's an issue for them, because there can be quite effective treatments for the problem. Then we looked at postnatal depression, another very, very common issue in pregnancy that has for so, so long been a stigma or been associated with stigma. And so people are unwilling to bring it up because you don't want your family to be tainted with de depression or mental health, but it is common. And so we had a um, guest speaker, one of uh, my colleagues, a GP, Dr. Helen of New Wine Platter. Check that out, check her channel out. She shares lots of wonderful, inspirational life um, videos, uh, really encouraging 
and um, fun videos as well. So check out New Wine Platter. Um, what we talked about overcoming postnatal depression, the issues around and came away with the idea that not only should families, friends um, and people, uh, women who have just had a baby be proactive about looking for the symptoms or expressing the symptoms, but we as clinicians, doctors and nurses and healthcare givers should be asking proactively after a woman has had a baby. So we also looked at high blood pressure, another big issue around pregnancy. And then we sort of looked at moms dying in pregnant in childbirth or in pregnancy. What are the common causes? What, what, what makes it, what happens? A woman, she's you know, otherwise healthy. She's just had a baby and a couple of days later, she slumped or during labor, something happens and she dies. What, what, what causes these things to happen? So we took a little bit, of, uh, took a little, little look. <laughs> I can get my voice out took a little look at that. Um, and so we've gone, I, I'm actually quite um, pleased that we've covered this wide area. And so today, let me introduce you to the topic for today. We're talking about the cesarean section and an A to Z of what every expecting mom and her family, so partner, husband, relatives, friends, should know about cesarean section because there's still a lot that we need. There's still a lot of information a gap between where people should, uh, people, what people should have that will encourage a healthy network and community um, of healthy families, healthy moms. There's a gap between that and where we are at the moment where there's still in many parts of the world very high mortality rate and a lot of it can be associated or linked to low cesarean section rate. So we want to look at it and look at what are the issues and what is the balance needed because there's some there are varying ideas about cesarean section around the world. So these that's the topic for today. But those are the issues that we've looked at. And so I would encourage you to go to the stream and to the channel. I beg your pardon. Go to the uh, Ask the Way Health channel, and on the channel you will find um, live streams. And I'm going to put a link, of course, to that information in the in the um, description box for this video so that you can have a look at it and pick whichever one you want to go through, go through all of them. And if you want to ask any more questions, any particular thing jumps out at you, by all, mean, by all means, send us a message. It can be a direct message on YouTube here, or you could send us a message via our Instagram page or as an email on info at askawayhealth.org or via Twitter. So you can find us in all the areas of social media. I hope you will connect with us and um, share your experience or ask a question. So this week we're looking at life-saving caesarean section or taboo. So which is it, life-saving or taboo and what you should know. So we're going to look at it, I thought, in three different aspects. So the first part I thought we would look at what caesarean section, when is it necessary, who needs them, um, and sort of look at the types of caesarean section that could happen and explore the reasons for the planned and the unplanned caesarean section. So that's the first segment I would love us to have a look at. And the second aspect I wanted us to look at was what are the complications or risks of having a caesarean section? Talk about these. So we look at the process. Um, let's have a look at what actually happens during a caesarean section and then look at some of the risks that could happen to mom and baby as well as how to look after yourself if you have had a caesarean section um what what do you do when you've left hospital how do you make sure that you recover best we'll have a little, little look at that and the last segment will that will be to talk about the issues the taboos the fears the beliefs about caesarean section what's in the mind of people, why do they think this way? And if we know that, that could help push us forward towards perhaps helping to take things around. So that is what the, that's my agenda for today. Hopefully I will be successful in achieving the agenda. So if you're out there, um, make sure you give us a shout out. Hello. Um, Hello, Amaka. Thank you so much for joining. Nice topic for conversation. She says, absolutely. I'm so glad you could join us today. Um, so please send a shout out and um, ask a question or share your experience, please, because, you know, we might have had CSEs or know someone who's had a caesarean section. I have had a caesarean section myself, so I can speak from both 
sides of the table as a patient and as a clinician, um, which gives you so it gives you a good, nice balanced flavor. So, all right, let's just jump in. What is a cesarean section? And very simply, and I know many people are familiar with the term. We're talking about delivering a baby through a cut in your abdomen and the womb. So that's simple definition. Of course, it involves a lot more than that, but that's it, just sort of straightforward. That's pretty much what it is, to be honest with you. Now, um, in many developing countries, many low and middle um, income countries, the rates, the death rates for moms and children are very high, very, very high, particularly in countries like Nigeria, where in fact, Bill Gates once dubbed the country as one of the most dangerous places in the world to have a baby. Now, there are many, many reasons. And if you watch the live stream where we looked at the common reasons why women suddenly die, um, which I think is number, is it number eight or number nine, have a look on the live stream. But one of the reasons we think from this is the low cesarean section rates. And let me tell you why I say that. It, in, some, in, the, in some other countries, cesarean section as a method for delivering children or babies is thought to be used too often on the one hand, while in other countries, it's thought that it's not used enough, okay? For example, the rate is as high as, could be as high, even higher than 25% in China, or about 32% in Australia and New Zealand. And some figures or some studies suggest that it could be as high as 45% or even more in places like Brazil. And there are other places where it actually goes up to about 50% rate of caesarean section amongst the births, life births in the country. It's been argued, I mean, we need to put it in context. It has been argued and we should say that those rates we're talking about could be in excess of what you would expect for a medically justified um, operation. So we need to be clear um, because you can have, people can have caesarean sections that are, um, um, planned and from choice. So there's no medical reason to have the section. And that might be what bumps up, up bumps up those numbers. And particular of interest to me today is looking at medically justified C-sections. Um, and so on a contrast, as a contrast in several low income countries, and interestingly, this is where you have much more of the world's births happening, the rate of caesarean section is low. So for example, in West Africa, we're looking at rates under 5%. Some studies give 3% um, as you go from country to country, but on average, less than 5%. So you're looking at a huge, quite a big gap, isn't it, between 5% in West African countries and above 40% in places like um, Brazil, or about 30% in places like Australia. Now, the low rates in places in, like West Africa could be because the, the procedure is not available to people in their hospitals or in their health centers. They don't have the equipment. You don't have well-trained um, staff or, or um, adequately trained staff to carry out the procedure effectively. You know, that's, that's one, because you're talking about lower um, income countries. But it could also be as a result of hesitation to use the method, to use this intersection as a method of delivery. And we will look at that later on in the stream. But in the stream, but I have a treat for you because I really want us to have a good graphic um, understanding of what cesarean section is. And so I'm going to share with you my screen and um, let you watch this animated video of what happens during a cesarean section. Ah, I am just trying to toggle, where does this say share screen? Get there with me. I will get more adept with this, with time. I'm actually, I actually enjoy doing this, to be honest with you, <laughs> but sometimes it can be a bit tricky. So let me just, um, let's watch this movie. <clears throat> so this is a, a lady who's about to have a C-section. The doctor is just gauging the position of the baby. And she's having anesthesia. This is spinal um, anesthesia. So what that means is that she doesn't have to be put to sleep during the operation. The area from her back, from the um, uterus downwards is numbed. She doesn't feel any pain. And then she has a bladder, a catheter, a tube to collect urine inserted into her bladder. 
and then her skin is prepared. So it's cleaned, all that wiping you saw was cleaning. And then the surgeon makes the cut into the skin and separates the tissues until they get to the womb. So here he is at the womb, or here she is at the womb, because you could have a female surgeon, of course, <laughs> and separating the tissues, trying to get to, um, yeah, so that's, um, so yes, put, we're still clearing the tissues before we get to the womb, so you retract. Um, it's important to use that instrument to make sure you keep the bladder out of the way so no injury is done to the bladder because remember your bladder is right in front of your womb. So still clearing out tissues, they've just cut into the womb and there we can see the baby's head. So now the um, surgeon puts her hand into the space they've created to gently withdraw, gently and firmly withdraw baby. Okay, so baby is um, delivered and there we have the cord cut. And next, the placenta is delivered. Okay, and so now it's time to close things up carefully. So the womb is closed up carefully with stitches. Um, there we go. Things carefully tidied up, make sure there's no bleeding. All the different tissues that were cut as we opened up to get into the womb are closed. And finally, the skin is closed. And that is essentially what a caesarean section looks like. So I think we're now on the same page about what a caesarean, what happens to your body or to a woman's body during a caesarean section. So let us start talking a little bit more about things. Types of caesarean section. And I'm really referring to planned versus unplanned sections. So the section, the cesarean section is a process where you, you want to deliver the baby and you don't want to go down by the natural route, which is the vaginal route. The planned cesarean section is when something develops. I'm oh, sorry. When along the course of your pregnancy, before labor, something develops or something is detected. That means that a cesarean section birth will be most appropriate or, or well, yes, most appropriate choice in order to deliver safely. That is for your baby and for yourself. So it's an expected um, event, it's an expected procedure or method. Your doctor, so what I mean by that is that you're pregnant, things are sort of going on fine and then you go for your scan or you go for your um, appointments with your doctor and oh, or your midwife and oh, what's this? Hmm. And then we have to think about it. This could put you at risk or you may have had a pre-existing condition. Um, and so while you are pregnant, before you go into labor, the discussion begins that it's most likely you're going to have a cesarean section and you are told what to expect. You advise what's going to happen. It's already you have time to think it through and bring yourself to terms with the, with the decision or with the um, understanding that, um, yes, Perhaps you were hoping to have a vaginal birth or vaginal delivery. And now it looks like you're going to have a, an operation, an operative delivery. So it's expected within that um, sense of um, this information coming through to you before you go into labor. On the other hand, an unplanned section, you start labor, you get in, you get up to labor and begin labor with the intention to have a vaginal delivery. But for some reason, something happens along the way, the cesarean section becomes necessary. And it's really important because a lot of the times when we fall into the issue of um, people with either refusing cesarean section or struggling with the idea um, could happen when they're in labor. It could be the doctor tells a woman, you know, some months before, some weeks before that, your child is breached and it's a cesarean section is a safe method of delivery. Um, some women might decide, you know, this is not for me, I'm not interested in this, or they're afraid. And so many, there are many different reasons we have, we're going to look at them. Um, but it, that, if she does agree to have the cesarean section at that point, that's planned. Um, it's different from somebody who comes into the hospital and is going through labor normally or she's having a home birth and things are going normally. And then suddenly her clinician or whoever is attending her birth finds out that there is a problem and vaginal delivery is unsafe. And then cesarean section, it becomes 
an imperative. It's crucial. It's important because if you do not carry out the cesarean section, at that point, you're at risk of losing the baby. The concern, of course, with the planned section is the same, that you could lose mom and baby if you do not um, follow through with surgery. So it's important to say that whether it's planned or unplanned, the risk is that mom or baby could die. But with the unplanned, there isn't really much time for somebody who's not even considered it at all. There isn't even much time to get used to the idea. It's that you need to understand that if this doesn't happen now, we might lose you or the baby. So this, that's the difference between the planned and unplanned cesarean section. So why, what are the reasons for a planned cesarean section? And I'm going to go through them very quickly. I don't think I have a graphic. I haven't got a graphic. So let me just go through this for you. So your baby could, it could be thought while you're um, pregnant that your baby is large. So our baby is too big to go through your pelvis. Now, there isn't a 100% accurate way of estimating um, the size, but with scans, you could, you could make some reasonable, reasonably good judgment. So your obstetrician could make a, a reasonably good judgment um, given your frame. And there are certain conditions that increase the risk of having large babies, for example, diabetes. So it, if, if it is that, it's thought that you could have a very large baby and too large to pass through your pelvis, then, and through your birth canal, then a planned cesarean section might be, uh, will be offered. The same for a baby who's breech, which I just mentioned some time ago, or, or a transverse position, which is, so breech is when the baby's sitting the upside down, if you like, because at the time of um, labor and delivery, baby should be um, turned in such a way that their head is presenting or their head comes first through the birth canal. Um, which has certain, which is designed to make delivery of the baby easier because the shape of the head, the way it moves, all that allows the free and smooth flow through the canal, which the bottom of the baby cannot. The bottom of the baby is just a rigid sort of, you know, ball, but the head is able to flex on the neck and do movements and things which allow the baby. So it's really important to understand. Um, and if transverse position means that the baby sort of instead of so the head is across the side as, as it comes to delivery, how how that's imagine how possible it is to deliver um, a child who's lying transverse across with the head across instead of um, in the in the birth canal or in your pelvis at the time of delivery at the time your labour starts, multiple pregnancy, um, having twins or triplets are reasons for a planned cesarean section. Another reason is if there's a problem like placenta previa, is a placenta, there are lots of different conditions of the placenta. So placenta previa is one of them. You could also have medical conditions like severe heart problems, whereby it is thought that going through labor, undergoing labor for some women, for example, first time women and moms who might labor for more than eight to 12 hours um, could put considerable strain on them. And so the best or the, the way to preserve both moms Health and babies would babies health would be to have a cesarean section. Um, infections, for example, sexually transmitted infections like genital herpes. If the mom has that kind of infection that is active at the time of her delivery, because you do not you want to reduce the risk of the baby contracting the infection as it passes through the birth canal, mom will mom will be advised to have a, a cesarean section. And if you've previously had a cesarean section, now, of course, if you've had one cesarean section, you can get away with a, a vaginal birth trial or a vaginal birth after cesarean section. But if you've had a more, usually more than one and depends on the type of cesarean section you had the first time, you may need to have a cesarean section again. Um, we'll look into that a little bit later, but these are some of the reasons for having a planned C-section. What about an unplanned C-section, an unplanned C-section? These are the reasons that may develop suddenly, that is, while you're laboring, so while you're you know, already in labor, you're, um, you've started to dilate, your waters have broken, and the intention is to deliver vaginally. But something develops, and it means that vaginal delivery is no longer safe at that point, and it could be <clears throat> Excuse me. It could be something to do with mom. It could be something to do with baby. Um, we refer to we we got a term that's um, dystocia. Dystocia is a term that we use to refer to difficult labor, and there's so many things that come under that. One of the most common that could affect a woman is a failure to progress in her labor. 
and it could be that her cervix is dilating very, very slowly or hardly after a particular point. Um, now, remember that when you go into labor, everything that's happening, so once your waters are broken and your cervix starts to dilate, everything that's happening is that you're trying to get, your contractions are trying to get to the point, your body to the point where the cervix has dilated up to 10 centimeters and has risen up. Remember that the cervix is the neck of the womb. So it's that first part of the womb that juts into the vagina and it is the, um, the it is the, because it's the neck of the womb, it actually keeps the womb closed throughout your pregnancy. Your cervix is closed with a plug of mucus, and that's to protect your baby, the sac and the baby inside. As your as preg as your labor begins, that plug comes away, and some women see a see a rush of fluid that they call show, rush of fluid and you know some some mucus. That's that plug giving way, and the cervix starts to soften and starts to come up and starts to widen. Everything else that's happening, your contractions are trying to pull up, open up the cervix, pull it up and widen so that the baby has room to come through. And many times in most new moms, it might take quite some time compared to um, moms who've had, who've delivered before. So it could take a number of hours. But a lot of particularly first time moms are not able to progress to full dilation of the cervix. And so we say that failure to progress. Okay, another problem may be that you might be dilating okay, but the baby is not coming down. Even if you're having really good contractions and the baby is not really coming down properly or hasn't come down enough for, to be able to just get through, even at the point of full dilatation and pushing good contractions to be able to get through the, the canal. And sometimes if the baby is managed to get down low enough, you could use forceps or um, instruments to assist the delivery, like forceps or vacuum. But if baby's still high up, or if the cervix just hasn't dilated up to 10 centimeters, then that's surgery. And at that point, while, the, while you're being examined, you're having your vaginal examination, and we're monitoring the how um, wide the cervix is, the baby is also being monitored because <laughs> while um, labor is stress for mom, it's also stress for the baby. So then we're looking at the baby's heart rate as well to make that judgment. But if there's no progress in labor, the decision for cesarean you know, section will be taken, and that's an unplanned one. Other problems could be as the baby's coming through, um, the head's being delivered, but the shoulder is trapped, and do everything. I mean, that's an, an emergency because the baby is going to be in distress, so you need to bring baby out as soon as possible. And again, problems could happen with the placenta. For example, if it starts to come away from the wall of the womb, um, which is known as placental ab abruption. Induction of labor that fails, and just briefly, induction of labor is when your doctor, your midwife stimulate contractions in your pregnancy before labor starts itself. So sort of like being proactive to get labor going um, in order to achieve a vaginal birth. So it could happen for a number of medical reasons. Um, commonly, because you want to avoid a prolonged pregnancy. So for example, a woman is getting to um, 40 weeks, past 40 weeks, and she's not had the baby, and labor has not started naturally, then induction of labor can be planned. Um, or if your membranes break before labor begins, that your water has broken, but you haven't started, your, your cervix isn't um, softening, you're not uh, contracting. If there's an infection, if there's poor growth of the baby, if there's diabetes or high blood pressure, these are some conditions where Induction of labor, that is, the labor hasn't started, but they are concerned and you want this baby to be born. And so the doctor wants to induce the womb to start contracting um, in order to achieve the vaginal birth. So the intention is the vaginal birth, but it might fail. And if it fails, um, sometimes, depending on the scenario, please, it's really important to say, um, depending on the scenario, it could be repeated, but, um, um, Again, depending on what your situation is, if it's if the induction of labor has failed, then the next step would be to have a cesarean section. So what happens when you're being induced? Um, you usually go into the hospital maternity unit. You would have a tablet or pessary, or it could be a gel inserted into your vagina, um, which its job is supposed to soften the neck of the um the cervix, the neck of the womb, that's the, the cervix, and uh, and starts your womb contracting. 
Um, so some people get to go home um, in some places, in some centers, other people will stay and then will be observed for the beginning of contractions. Um, and then the decision will be made depending on what the outcome. Um, if contractions haven't started, maybe they might repeat the tablet, put in your vagina, continue observing. And if it hasn't, or if it's been done already, if it's been repeated already, then the plan to have caesarean, caesarean section. Now, what about, so these are some of the reasons that you might have an, un, an unplanned C-section because of the mom. What about the baby? I've said already that just as mom is undergoing stress during labor, so is the baby. Um, and if any sign of distress, so it could be very, very fast heart rate or the baby's heart rate drops, any of these might uh, would indicate that a, a caesarean section needs to be performed because um, obviously, if you try to continue in vaginal delivery with a baby who is so distressed, then the chances of losing that baby are very high. So you want to cut that out, of, you know, you want to remove that option altogether quickly, quickly get um, the baby out and assist or support the baby, remove whatever is causing the distress. And the position of the cord um, is important. If it's spotted that the, co the cords around the uh, baby's neck during uh, so for example, in some cases, um, a vigilant midwife or, or clinician examines and feels the cord right in the birth canal around the baby's neck or sort of right in the canal because of how sensitive it is and the, the risk of damage while uh, trying to while the baby is trying to navigate its way through the canal could even cause an obstruction. So it makes things very difficult. That is an, a, an urgent need to get the mom into theater and um, deliver the baby. So these, when medically indicated, caesarean section is a life-saving event or intervention. It's crucial. It is necessary to save the life of both mom and baby. Okay. Next, we're going to look at, I'm just looking at my agenda. So next, we're going to have a look at any risks and complications for caesarean section. Um, like I said, let me know if you have any questions, any comments, that would be great. But let us look at the risks and complications of caesarean section. So, um, actually, ah, yes, actually what I wanted, oh yes, I think what I wanted to do was sort of talk you through what happens during the section. So very quickly, I know we've sort of seen a, that really good video that's a good graphic that shows us what happens now I also have actually I should have it here so it should be here already bear with me so I'm just going to pull up another video to share with you and um <clears throat> okay so I think that should be showing so I hope that's showing I'm not sure now okay but I'm just going to quickly uh, let's just talk through so when you're going to have the caesarean section, particularly if it's a planned one, um, what happens, you know, there's time to be able to, if, if you've got, if, if it's something that's planned and so all the necessary um, treatments and all the things that you require are in place, you might be giving some tablets to dry your mouth and your airway, uh, maybe even an antacid because if you're going to have, if they need to convert the sort of surgery to, general anesthetic they want to make sure that you're protected and are unlikely to vomit while you're um, um unlikely to vomit while you're on, unconscious or under anesthesia that could cause um, um acid to get into your lungs and could cause injury your as we saw in the movie the lower part of your tummy your abdomen is, is washed <clears throat> might be shaved as well <clears throat> Um, trying to minimize any chance of infection. A tube is passed into your bladder to keep it empty and reduce any chances of injury. And of course, an anesthetic could be administered as we saw in that video, um, an epidural or spinal anesthetic, but in some areas you could have a general anesthetic where you're placed to, where you're put to sleep altogether. And then the abdomen is cleaned with antiseptic solution. We did see that in the, um, we did see that in that movie that I showed. And the cuts is made through the um, abdomen and through the other tissues until we get into the womb. And the cuts in the abdomen could be across, so sort of following a bikini line. In some cases, it might be a vertical, so straight across. It depends on 
if it's planned, most likely a bikini line, but in some cases, if it's an emergency, it might be a vertical incision. It's less common, but it is possible. So baby is eased out, baby is cleaned, baby is handed over to the, um, the pediatrician or the baby's caregiver, and then the wound, your wound is closed up. Um, so these are some of the things that you would experience during the cesarean section. And as soon as the baby is born, um, particularly if you've had spinal or epidural anesthesia, if you feel up to it, you have the option to hold your baby in the delivery room. Um, you'll be closely monitored, taken to the recovery room outside of the theater once doctors finish stitching, stitching up and the anesthetic is um, happy for you to be moved out of the OR and you're taken to the recovery room, continue being monitored, your blood pressure, your pulse, your breathing, key things that are being looked at for there. Um, bleeding and any other complications, you get antibiotics as well to reduce the chances of any infection and of course pain medication. Um, and as your system stabilizes and there are no complications, you know, you go back, you go out to the postnatal, postnatal ward or postnatal unit, um, breastfeeding, bonding with your baby if you're able, trying to get used to be, keep, keeping yourself being kept comfortable, learning from the midwife, um, the breast advice about how to help to get your baby to latch on and things like that. Um, within six to eight hours of your surgery, your catheter will be removed. It's just kept in place to monitor your urine. Um, it's put in, in the first instance, I should have said actually, the catheter is put in place to empty your bladder because your bladder is right in front of the womb. And one of the things that could cause a problem and result in injury to the bladder is if you're full, if your bladder is full of urine and the doctor is trying to open and get into your womb, the bladder gets in the way. So you like to keep the bladder as well away. So empty the bladder. Then um, once you get into the area where the bladder is a special force that is put in there to retract the, the bladder well away from the womb, the cutting area. So no injury is done. Um, you might, you need intravenous fluids. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. You have an IV infusion put in um, before your surgery, usually done by the anesthetic. This is from my experience, I'm also recalling. Um, so you have an IV fluids put in through which they'll give you your pain medicines, give you the medicines that you need during labor and, and um, intravenous fluids um, that you need during the, um, during this, the procedure. Um, that can continue for a couple of days until you're eating and drinking okay and then it's taken away. You would have some tablets, um, painkillers to keep on. You might have continued antibiotics um, by mouth. Um, and generally, if everything's gone well, that's the process. You'll be discharged from hospital usually three to five days after your surgery um, to go home, continue recovery at home. And, and that's generally it for a smooth outcome. Now, now that we know what the process is and what to expect, it's generally the same for an unplanned, <laughs> but of course it's in the setting of an emergency. So all the preparation that you might have. And so there are more risks being taken at that point. And your doctor, the one who's going to carry out the surgery has to be a lot more careful to make sure that um, extra precautions are taken, particularly if it's an unplanned section. So what are the risks from cesarean section? Now, I'm going to go through these um, issues. Abnormal bleeding, abnormal bleeding either from, <clears throat> from having surgery. Um, you, you saw from the video the different areas that I've been cut into. So all those parts of the, the body, the, the tissues underneath and the womb have blood vessels. If they're not properly closed, if by um, the accident, the blood vessel is cut into, that could cause severe bleeding. And that bleeding could become life-threatening um, or result in very severe anemia, very severe illness um, to the mom. Um, another possible side effect is the of complication of a cesarean section is a blood clot. And I'm going to share with you a couple of images I put together because it was really important. I thought for us to look at. Now, let me share my screen and then I will explain to you. So one of the risks of a C-section is the development of blood clots. Okay, so let's share the screen here and... Okay, so what you're looking at now is a blood clot. Somebody's holding a blood clot. You can see that shiny piece of congealed, um, soft, soft, so feels soft, soft and squishy like a piece of liver, but it's very, very easily breaks apart. That's a blood clot. Okay, 
Now, there's a risk of this developing this within your blood vessels. Let me see if I can get the next picture. Yeah, okay. There's a risk of developing this within your blood vessels. Now, you do what, what you just saw, somebody holding, this is, um, this may be vaginal bleeding, you know, so blood coming out from the vagina um, and coming out as blood clots. But when the body begins to form clots inside the blood vessels in the body, it's called deep vein thrombosis. It could happen in any blood vessel. Um, now, this, when this problem happens, so let me put the two pictures side by side. So when this happens, it can cause blockage of the blood vessel, which depending on where it happens, can cause so many serious medical problems, including death. So it can cause strokes, it can cause difficulty breathing, it can cause, um, essentially it can lead to death. So it's a very serious medical problem. It is more likely to happen if a woman is pregnant. So if you compare two women, same age, everything exactly the same, but the difference is that Mrs. A is pregnant and Mrs. B is not. Mrs. A is more likely to experience a blood clot just because she's pregnant. Now, when Mrs. B, or whoever I said <laughs> was pregnant, has, uh, has a caesarean section, she has surgery, having surgery, further increases the risk of cesarean section. So it's important for us to know um, about that, the serious medical condition, and it's the risk from having a cesarean section, which of course your doctors should be vigilant about. One of the reasons that after cesarean section, women are asked to wear compression stockings to reduce the risk of blood clots happening, or they might need to have injections to thin their blood. Another risk from a caesarean section is injury to the bladder and other internal organs, risk of infection, although this can be efforts are made to reduce this as much as possible before the procedure or just afterwards by starting antibiotics. And of course, complications from anesthesia, because as we said, and as you saw, you could have an anesthetic into your, um, into your back, either spinal or epidural anesthesia or you could be put to sleep so um, people could react to it or um, they might develop problems um, from the anesthetic um, difficulty coming around from the anesthetic it might affect um, blood pressure it might so different these these are not just specific to c-section this might be simply specific to having surgery and having anesthesia but it is possible having a cesarean section might also affect the bonding between mom and baby after delivery, particularly if mom is not well. So if she didn't have a smooth operation and some complication developed, then it's difficult to start that bonding period um, after she's after babies come out. Having one cesarean section also increases the chance of future sections. So that's a risk, isn't it? That you've had one, it might mean that next time around, and um, we've talked about the you know, possibility of vaginal delivery after, after vaginal birth, after C-section, but it may not be suitable for everyone. It is very specific. It's, each case has to be discussed with your doctor. You can say that, well, a woman who's had a caesarean, one caesarean section, yes, she could have a trial of vaginal birth, that's true, but it also does depend on what happened during her previous section, why she had the section. If that, if that reason is still there, then it's unlikely she's gonna have a vaginal birth. So it's just so that you're, you know, we are aware of these things. And um, having a C-section, a previous C-section can increase the risk of developing placenta problems, placenta previa, placenta preta, with conditions that are, that are linked to moms becoming ill or babies becoming ill as well, or even dying. So that's important. Um, what are the risks from C-section? Let's talk about baby. Um, baby could inadvertently get it caught in the skin. This is common. Um, and this might happen accidentally because you can see how carefully on that video, how carefully the doctor has to tease through. It doesn't just go and cut and from skin to, to wound, no, cut skin cut the underlying tissue, cut the underlying um, fascia, separate the muscles, cut the tissue directly in front of the, um, the womb, then cut into the womb, gently open the, um, the, the amniotic sac. So there's a lot of care and sometimes the scalpel might slip or something might happen and maybe it gets a little cut. So that's a possible complication. Now, this is usually minor because again, 
your surgeon realizes that they have to be, be very careful. You need to be apply firm but gentle pressure with care because you know how delicate the tissues that you're dealing with. So it's usually quite minor and heals without any problem in the majority of cases. Uh, it's also possible for breathing problems. It could happen. Um, it could happen particularly if babies are born before 39 weeks. It does improve after a few days, but it has been observed that there may be problems breathing as a risk of caesarean section. So what should you expect after, after your surgery, after your C-section? Now, you, you can breastfeed your baby as soon as you can if you want to, and if you feel well and able, that's encouraged, okay? And like I said before, um, if you've had an uncomplicated procedure, looking at three to five days of stay in hospital. Expect bleeding. What should you expect? Vaginal bleeding will happen because even though you've had, you've not had vaginal um, delivery, your baby has and placenta have been delivered from the womb. So the womb is going to recover and you're still going to have lochia as you would uh, uh, um, if you are delivered vaginally. So you would still expect some vaginal bleeding to happen. Bleeding from the wound site, from where you've had the surgery that the doctor has stitched up, should be minimal as your wound heals. Okay? Infection is a possibility, but you know, as much as possible is done to try and reduce the risk of that happening. So infection of the wound um, could happen. That is, it might become red, it might become swollen, it might become smelly, it might see a discharge, it might feel very, a, lot of, a lot more pain than you'd expect from the wound. And that's because it's gotten infected or an infection of the womb itself. So watch out for things like a fever, tummy pain that's a lot more severe than what you expect because you would expect some discomfort as you come away from, as you recover from anesthesia. You've just had surgery, you've just had a cut into um, your womb, your deep, deep organs. So yes, you would have some pain and you would have regular, uh, you would have pain medication prescribed. But if the pain becomes quite severe, then we'd be worried about possibility of an infection in the womb. Um, or if there's an abnormal smelly discharge, very, very heavy bleeding might suggest or indicate that. Um, so I've talked about pain. So pain from the operation site is expected. Initially, any movement that you make, maybe it's just turning, trying to turn around, it might be difficult to even turn around in bed or try and sit up. But that pain is present when you move, when you try and talk or laugh, cough. The painkillers are available. Please use them if you're prescribed painkillers. Please make use of them. If you're struggling with pain, please don't endure. Pain could be a suggestion of something else going on, which is why you shouldn't just keep quiet about it. You should say to somebody, I'm experiencing pain and let us have a look to work out, well, is this because you know, you're really hurting, but you're fine and you're healing, in which case you might need some stronger pain medicine or does it suggest an infection going on somewhere? And, and what next? Um, as soon as you can, start getting around um, at your, your midwife. Um, I will encourage you uh, while you're breastfeeding or, you know, when you're well enough, get out of bed, sit up and start taking small, gentle steps around. The quicker you're able to resume activity, the better overall for your health. Um, of course, we advise against strenuous activity for the first six to eight weeks um, after your caesarean section while your wound heals. So what you can do after you've left the hospital and you're back home and you need small steps, small walks, um, maybe around your, your house or your area, do not resume high intensity exercise, please. No matter how desperate you are to get back into shape, please, until your wound is completely healed and your, the rest of your body is not just your wound, the rest of your body. So you need to be careful, otherwise you might do yourself more damage. Gradually build up your strength and then you can go back into your usual exercise routine. It's not it's difficult to say a specific time for one woman after the other, but we know that by at least six or eight weeks, your wound is doing well. Um, and so you, you might be able to do a bit of lifting, moderate, moderate weights. Um, but I definitely wouldn't be recommending if you've just had a CS three, four months ago to start getting and doing, you know, high intensity, jumping and running. You need some, let your, let your tissues fully heal and recover. So it might take a good few months before you can get back into any kind of routine mentally and physically. Um, it's possible to start having sex within weeks of your delivery. Um, again, the six to eight week rule applies here because what you want is your tissues both inside and outside 
to heal properly. Um, having sexual intercourse, the action, the pressure of sexual activity, the, the movement could injure your wound. So that's what you're trying to prevent. But the thing is, when you do start having sexual intercourse, please, please think about contraception because you don't want to fall pregnant again so soon after the cesarean section. I mean, first of all, you have to think about your body and recovering, being able to carry another baby, but coping with the one that you have, getting used to their pattern and their demands, that you need to get that get that sorted out. So please speak to your health provider about contraception. What about future children? I'm just sort of thinking well ahead of after your, your surgery, vaginal birth after cesarean section, specific to every woman, discuss with your doctor. It is possible, depends on several things, like I've said, how many times have you had cesarean sections? You've had three, you're not going to have vaginal birth after cesarean section, that's unlikely. Um, what was the reason for the previous section? How how did they repair your wound, or how did they repair your your um, yeah your wound really when they were closing up? These are important things that should be discussed with your gynecologist, your obstetrician. I beg your pardon. Um, when trying to make that decision, okay, how can you recover quickly? Because that's really important. So you know, so you can get back into feeling better and then being able to manage looking after your baby as well as you can. And uh, before. Before you, you labor, try and be as active as you can. So during your pregnancy, if it's simple walks, short walks, but frequently yoga, swimming, try and be as active as you can. That helps your tissues so get their supple already so they get back into shape quickly after your section. So then start moving around as soon as you're cleared by your doctor and your midwife. So as soon as it's okay for you to be able to take steps and start doing little exercise like walking, um, pushing your baby around in the pram, that go ahead, please, because that helps your healing, helps your tissues, helps blood flow to your tissues, so that helps healing, helps your bowels to move better which also manages, which also gets rid of feeling sick. Because some women complain about their bowels and then because they're constipated, that can affect them, um, give them feelings of vomiting. So that, that being active also helps them address that as well as taking plenty of fluids and fiber. Um, but being active also helps to start feeling stronger and can help to reduce the risk of blood clots, which we've talked about already. But one of the key risks with developing, or one of the key factors with developing blood clots tends to be being immobile and being in bed all the time, being inactive increases the risk of blood clots, which is sometimes why they can happen more frequently in older people who are bed bound or immobile. Right, so, uh, oh, and then, um, <laughs> um, consider getting, having, I mean, some people talk about getting a belly band to hold away um, high-waisted, joggers and getting a belly band around your middle to hold everything together to sort of keep everything firmly in place and you can get a hot water bottle or cushion to use against your lower abdomen particularly while your wound is healing especially when you want to cough or sneeze just hold that against your, your middle or your um, lower abdomen to help reduce stitches pressure on your stitches and help to reduce any pain right so we're going to be rounding up very very soon i promise and um I, I thought it was really important to set that background for us, really important to look at those areas. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look at the stream now um, and say hello to IB Sam. Thank you for joining. Good to have you around. Let me know if there's anything you want to contribute to, to this. And I hope your baby is doing well. So let us look at the taboo this section about taboo, and we'll use that bit to, to round up. So what, what are the fears that many women associate? What are the concerns that many women and families, not just the, so it's not just the women, I keep, you know, we, we just say, oh, the woman, but it's actually a whole culture, a whole mindset and attitude behind it that's also linked to family. So there are some ideas that could be religious beliefs or cultural beliefs or distrust of medical practitioners. Um, that create a, a sense of fear when the when some people are faced with the possibility of cesarean section. Now, in developing countries, some of the main issues could be things like cost um, of having the surgery and the stigma. Those are the main things that would act as barrier barriers to accessing surgery. So it might be the cost of the operation can be quite expensive, where there isn't a um, where there's, there isn't access, free access to healthcare as you have in some countries like the NHS in the UK, 
or um, and in places like Nigeria where you may have to pay out of pocket for healthcare, having a cesarean section in a private hospital can be very costly. Now, health insurance schemes, which um, have started with a very slow, sluggish uptake because people didn't see you know, the benefit of health insurance, but um, the trend is slowly improving, but health insurance schemes um, now are coming up in places like um, in Nigeria and other uh, developing countries where women can have a cesarean section, free cesarean section and supporting care on their plan, which encourages, if it's required, which encourages um, women and their families to be more to be more open or uh, to find the method acceptable, which increases its uptake. Um, so cost is a big issue. Obstacles to access, particularly in rural areas where you don't have large hospitals and you don't have, it's, it's difficult to get to a sort of district or big enough hospital where you could have a cesarean section. Um, and in the, even, even natural or vaginal, natural and vaginal births even proceed with unskilled birth attendants. So even having a simple, um, well-equipped primary center in a village would be could be difficult in some places and so they rely on unskilled birth attendants a lot of the time. Another big issue I want to address in developing countries is where women have limited control over their own birth and birth process, well you know their delivery process. Um, there's one study of a Nigerian hospital that showed that in 90% of cases the moms, the women, believed that men should be the ones to, to sign the consent form enabling them to undergo caesarean section. So that puts the decision firmly in the man's hands. So this comes from the background of a culture that is very patriarchal um, and of course where the man is most often the breadwinner and the primary economic driver in the family. Such decisions are, are sort of left to him um, so I can't do this until my husband comes which is which is quite wrong because the truth is that um, if the woman is able to understand the, proce the procedure and she is um, her mental acumen is fit so she's not confused she's able to control her own mental functions um, she can give consent to a procedure that's going to be carried out on her own body without recourse to her husband. But as I said, the challenge is, what if she's not the one paying for the surgery? What if the cost to her, for example, if a general birth is in the hospital is say 30,000 Naira and the cost to have a cesarean section is 200,000 Naira. Um, you, you can see that, you can see where the hesitation cooled even to the point where your life, the woman's life depends on it, but it's the cost issue and how she cannot take that decision, particularly if the husband's not there. She, she cannot take that decision just because um, she's not the one that controls the money bag. So where the husband is often the breadwinner, um, that decision falls to him, which is obviously wrong because um, this is um, her life that's at, that's at stake here, her and the babies. And it's something that we need to be educating people about and providing the empowerment for that mindset to change um, when people are told what the appropriate thing should, should be, particularly when it impacts on life, on a loss of life. Let's look at the cultural beliefs because this is part of the problem where it has, where, um, why, why people consider caesarean section to be a taboo, why people will not accept a caesarean section. So part of the problem can stem from the fact that caesarean births are stigmatized as being less intimate or meaningful to a woman um, and her partner. And in fact, in some cultures, it's, it's taken as a vaginal birth, a vaginal delivery is taken as a right of womanhood. It shows that you are now a woman because you've pushed the baby out of the vagina. And so women who, people who follow that or who believe in that would mock, shame, stigmatize women who 
who have caesarean section. And so women would hide. If they have had the caesarean section, they would hide. Or if they're offered or advised to have the caesarean section, this is the mindset that could make them refuse to have the caesarean section um, uh, because of you know, the stigma they might experience that people might think that they are weak. In some cultures, the caesarean section is perceived as a curse. Having the operation is perceived as a curse on a woman. Or they might say, well, she had it because she's unfaithful. She must, she must be unfaithful. And that's why she had to have uh, this operation. Or they could say, well, there's something wrong with her. There's something, something's wrong. She has her, her shape. She cannot carry children. And so they, they, they blame her. I mean, yes, we've talked about um, baby size and pelvic size as being important, but not as not trying to ascribe blame because how much in control are you over the size of your pelvis? Um, so in some studies amongst um, you know, different cultures, they viewed caesarean section with suspicion, fear, guilt, anger even, and it's caused lots of misery. I'm not told number of deaths. There's also the fear of irreparable damage to the body because of the caesarean section. Now, um, so those are the culture, some of the cultural beliefs. What about healthcare beliefs? And I do have a graphic if I, let me just see if I did post it up so that you can have a look at the graphic while I'm speaking. Okay, so let me share this with you. See what we think. Uh, so let's share the screen. Aha. Okay, so hopefully you should see my screen. And these are some of the genuine fears um, that people have and that are not unreasonable. Fear of death. Um, I've talked about fear of damage to organs, fear of permanent damage. So fear that the doctor might not be good enough um, you know, reasonable fear if there's if if healthcare workers are not properly trained, fear of subsequent infertility, fear of the pain, um, and these are this is from a study They're taken from a um, hospital, looking at the different the different reasons that people perceived or had aversions to cesarean section. So these were some of the num some of the reasons that were given that they felt they would not be able to accept a caesarean um, section if it was offered to them. Right, okay, so let us have a, a look at uh, religious beliefs. That's another big one, particularly in countries where, um, particularly in countries where there is a, the, the, a lot of um, people who have, who profess um, different religions. So countries that are more religious than secular, and a, a very good example is Nigeria again, where Christian women commonly hear that giving birth vaginally is like being a Hebrew woman and is a sign of strength and competency and hold on to that belief. Um, and so refuse to their own detriment and to their own child's detriment, refuse to have caesarean section as a, as a result because they believe that having a baby vaginally is a virtue um, and in a country that's so deeply religious, it's become quite a, a, a big problem. Um, so that can push a woman or a family, you know, um, again, for religious beliefs. I, I read one, and I think this, this was, was it a few years ago now, where someone refused, what well, was she refused to have the section because her mother or was it her mother-in-law had a dream and... Um, was told that if she did have the section that she would die. So she refused the section and ended up dying from complications um, because she did not have the, um, because she did not have um, surgery. So it can have that kind of serious impact and it's really important. I think it's really important to keep these discussions going on, keep, up, keep, on, keep on having these discussions. So, when it is medically justified, caesarean section can be life-saving. You have well-trained healthcare workers and well-equipped um, health centers that will work to reduce the risks, all those risks that we talked about earlier. Um, and we've also got from some studies, and this was um, an interesting um, 
you know, looking at which women were more likely to have, I'm just going to see if I can pull it up for you, which women were more likely to have a caesarean section and which women were less likely to have a caesarean section. There's an interesting study. I'm just going to see if I can. I'm just going to see if I can pull up that graphic to share with you as well. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let me share my screen and this should show you. I will just quickly run through it. Um, and again, if you have any questions, get ready because I should be shutting the screen down in a few minutes. Okay, so um, yeah, women who are less likely to deliver by caesarean section, it's an old study, it is, but um, a woman who's less likely to deliver by caesarean section, um, women in um, certain regions of the country, Northwest and Northeastern region who profess Islam, women in poor or who are Muslims, women in poor households, a woman whose husband is not educated and who didn't attend antenatal care herself at all. And if the woman herself is not educated, women who live in rural areas are more likely to, more likely to or less likely to deliver by caesarean section, and women who've had genital cutting as well. On the other hand, women who are more likely to deliver by caesarean section from that same study, um, women who have access to health insurance, who deliver in private health facilities, women who are very overweight, multiple births, of course, we've looked at some of the reasons for caesarean section, women who have secondary education and are from a rich household, and women who comparatively, um, if you're looking at comparing between non-religious people versus Christian and Muslims, Christian, um, while the non-religious people are more likely to deliver between the Christian and the Muslims, the Christians are more likely to deliver by caesarean section. Living in the southwest of the country, um, so these are these are some of the sort of Oh, and women who have, I forgot that one, women who have attended antenatal care more than four times um, according to, to this study. So it's really important that these are some of the factors that affect people. And it's interesting, we need more studies. That was a very old study. And with time and with a lot of health education that's gone on over, um, over the years, um, Nigeria still has a dangerously high maternal mortality rate. It's still a very dangerous place to be pregnant and have a baby. Um, a lot more work has to be done. And that's one of the reasons for sharing this information because we need to tackle whether it's stigma for cultural or religious reasons, cost, poor healthcare access, all these are responsible for poor uptake of caesarean section when it is medically indicated. So we need to be educating not just women, but men, because you see how the family setting and the family structure is important. Men and um, relatives about um, why a caesarean section is necessary and how it could save, save life. Um, in addition to developing the healthcare systems and strengthening the healthcare structures that we need for people to accept that caesarean section can be safe for them and reduce the risks of some of those risks that we talked about. Um, a mentor with one of the agencies that works with pregnant women, Mamalet, um, gave an interview and um, a lot of the comments that they made I thought were quite instructive. The healthcare system is so overwhelmed that even the healthcare workers do not have the time to break down the information. So there's pressure on healthcare workers. The time to explain, like I've taken the time to explain, we've spent an hour plus trying to go through caesarean section. And I just wanted to put everything together in one place. So under the video, under the video in the description box, we'll break them down into sections, into chapters, so you can go to where you want to look at. But it takes time to explain these problems, these issues. And sometimes the healthcare system is so overwhelmed. Women don't have this information. They don't know where to go to get this information. They don't know who to ask, particularly when some people are afraid to disclose that they've had a caesarean section. 
And then when they ask, oh, how was it for you? How was labor for you? How was your delivery? Some women say, oh, you go and experience yours. And there's no, <laughs> there's no support. Um, so it's difficult for women to open up. They don't know who to ask and they can't ask questions. Or even when they do, they don't get answers. And this allows some of these um, cultural misconceptions or beliefs, uh, religious, religious beliefs to go without any challenge, to go without anybody saying, actually, because if you sit someone down and talk to them for a few minutes and say, well, why don't you think of it this way? You could make them look at it in a different way and make them change their mind. So many women who need a C-section, sometimes it just comes into their head. They don't think about it at all during pregnancy. And the first time it comes up is when they're in labor because the opportunity to have that chat with the health professional is not there. And at that point when they're in labor, then it's difficult to accept that they need surgery because they're grappling with those beliefs that they had, um, you know, the stigma or the shame or people going to be laughing at you or your family. Um, and the opportunity to say to them, this is going to save your life or your baby's life until it might be too late. So, um, so that's really what I wanted us to talk about today. Thank you for listening. Um, if you want to know, don't just take my word for it. If you want to know more about this topic, um, by all means, check the references I'm going to put down in the description box. But it's been great to have this opportunity to share with you. And this brings the pregnancy series um, for the time being to an end, because I'm sure we're going to continue looking at other pregnancy topics in future. So we'll just add it on to the series. But if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much for watching. Now, don't forget, Ask Away Health is on different social media platforms, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, LinkedIn. And of course, our website is askingwayhealth.org. We publish a new video once every week. Um, we've got a new one coming out on Tuesday, coming on Tuesday next week on the health benefits of scotch bonnet peppers. So if you're a pepper person, make sure you check that out and see hmm, health benefits versus risks if you eat too much pepper. Um, so make sure you have a look at that one. And if you haven't seen the latest video out on um, issues to do around losing stubborn belly fat, make sure you check that one out because you might be surprised that some of the methods that are so popular and hailed as, wow, this will definitely work, may not really address belly fat. So this is where we end the stream today. I really appreciate your joining me today. I hope you have a great day and a great weekend and I will see you again soon. Stay well.